Charles Bull. Oh, okay. Great. Uh, great. So, uh, okay, great. Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the Stanford Algebra Geometry Seminar. Uh, a few announcements before starting. Please mute yourself unless you have something you want to say. And if you're willing, please leave your video on. There's, uh, there's a parallel chat in Discord, uh, and please use it only if you feel like it. Some people find it distracting, others find that it helps you concentrate. And the speaker will not be watching the chat. The style of the seminar is traditionally being that people ask the speaker lots of questions, including really elementary ones, so please do so. And the seminar is small enough that if you have a question, just unmute yourself and just ask it out loud. Don't raise your hand because no one will notice. Uh, if you see a question in the discussion you think should be asked, just unmute yourself and ask that out loud. So we're glad to have Drew from Ranganathan from Cambridge, uh, who's going to tell us about constructing log logarithmic models. All right, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Ravi. It's, uh, uh, it's it's kind of amazing to be able to talk to people from all over the world in, uh, in the comfort of my my living room. Uh, and thanks for thanks for coming. So yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll speak about uh, this. Um, I'll speak about some aspects of this project that. That Devesh, uh, that Devesh and I have been working on for a couple of years now. Um, so our, our, our motivations were to, to, to study some logarithmic version of, of Donaldson-Thomas theory and see how it interacted with, with nearby questions like the gromov witten um, donaldson thomas correspondence. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, uh, what I'll focus on today is not so much the invariance curve counting side of the story, but just this object that comes out of what we, uh, uh, of what we of what we study, something we have to uh, end up constructing along the way. It's sort of the key, the key piece of this um, of this logarithmic Donaldson Thomas theory story. Um, and I think you know, particularly given that there are some people at Stanford that and various other places that have been thinking about log geometry this semester, I thought it would be a nice uh, a nice thing to talk about. Um, so, um, so so the basic place where all of this sits is, uh, is yeah, so as I said, in, in this world of curve counting. So there's, a, there, there's, um, there's in, 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 the, in the modern, uh, okay, whatever, in the last 15 years, uh, there are maybe two standard approaches to, to counting curves on a, on a smooth projective variety, say. Um, uh, so, so basically, uh, the two approaches are involving curves and involving sheaves. So, so in approach one or gromov witten theory, you probe the geometry of X by studying a moduli space of maps from curves into that, into your, your favorite variety X. Uh, and then you study the geometry and topology of that space, the space of stable maps. Um, uh, and you extract some numbers and you call those gromov witten invariants and then you uh, earn lots of money. Uh, all, alternatively, you can study some kind of moduli space of sheaves or in the simplest case, uh, just ideal sheaves. So, so you study the Hilbert scheme uh, off curves of one dimensional subschemes on X and, and you study its geometry and topology uh, and you extract some numbers. And then there's this remarkable, um, there's, you know, that, that story on its own has some remarkable, um, you know, th there's some remarkable developments there, uh, which is the, the MNOP co correspondence or the PONM correspondence as we call it here in England. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, okay, so, so that, was, that was part of our motivation to kind of better under, uh, understand that part of the story. Uh, and uh, a, a kind of recent development, recent as in maybe 10 years now, uh, is this logarithmic gromov witten theory, which, is, uh, which was uh, work of Abramovich, Chen, and, and independently of Gross and Siebert. So, so the idea basically is you replace X with a pair uh, and, and you get something out of that. So this is a very well-developed subject at this stage. So lots of people have written lots of very interesting papers, both theoretical and computational with applications to mirror symmetry and things like this. Uh, but, but for a long time, uh, this, this, this kind of final corner of the story was missing. So, so what are you supposed to do with ideal sheaves? Uh, or I'll get into more specifics, but, but broadly speaking, when I choose a simple normal crossings divisor on, uh, on a smooth projective variety, uh, how does the Hilbert scheme see that? So, so what, you know, what, what additional structure does that endow the Hilbert scheme with? Um, so, so just, you know, I'll, I'll, most of this talk will be, will be about specifics, but just to say a few words about you know, why this is interesting, why did people care about this before, because I won't say much about it later. Um, the, the basic, a, a basic strategy in enumerative geometry is to, is to go from studying uh, smooth varieties to, to reducible singular varieties and try and use uh, you know, curve counting invariants on singular varieties, on certain mildly singular varieties, log smooth varieties, to, to get some information about, um, uh, about the enumerative invariants of X itself. Uh, and, 
and, and, and that's basically the, the, the thing that you're forced to do, the thing that you're forced to reckon with uh, is the geometry of pairs when you do that. Uh, and maybe I'll say, you know, why is it different? Uh, I, I, um, you know, wh wh why can't you just do what Abramovich, Chen, Gross, and Siebert did? For those of you who know that story or have heard of it, um, basically it's, it's kind of easy to say that the definitions don't make sense. So that's where, that's where the situation was uh, when, we, when we started thinking about this problem, that there was no good definition of a logarithmic version of the Hilbert scheme. And I'll get into more specifics about all of that now. Uh, but maybe if you have any questions about the context, now is a perfectly good time. Uh, otherwise, I'll just move on. Uh, okay, so so what I'll tell you about today is the logarithmic Hilbert scheme of curves. Okay, so so I'll never I'll never really use anything about log structures in this. So so it's just it's just a word uh, it's just a word for now. Uh, so so the idea is to start with with x as some kind of uh, let's say uh, let, let's just say smooth projective threefold, so I don't have to change it partway through. Um, okay, maybe say smooth projective variety, and I'll uh, I'll tell you why we want threefold later. Um, uh, and we endow X with, with a simple normal crossings divisor. So, so a, um, a possibly reducible uh, collection of divisors that meet nicely and transversely. Uh, and the, the principal object, the starting object is the Hilbert scheme of curves on X, okay? So, uh, so uh, the Hilbert scheme of curves comes with some universal structures. So there's the, there's the universal subscheme uh, sitting, uh, sitting inside the product. Uh, and you know, as, as given right now, so uh, the Hilbert that, scheme. Yeah. So actually, um, are you doing? Are you now saying simple normal crossings because you mean that, or now are you happily thinking secretly in some crazy log world where can this be? Yeah, you know, uh, we actually set things up exactly in this simple normal crossings framework. After the fact, one can say log smooth, and that's fine. Or, or depending on on what you want to construct, even maybe less than log smooth. But, but uh, just just so I won't have to keep changing my assumptions. Great. I'll, but but, but, but just secretly, not that I'm really going to do this, but. Everything without change could work for log smooth. Yeah, yeah, it, I, yeah. I think if 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 one is comfortable talking about toroidal embeddings, for example, then then any you toroidal, could, then any toroidal embedding will work. For this. Yeah, that's right. Any toroidal embedding will work, and and you'll have to modify some things that I say in some in some mild way. But probably if you know what a toroidal embedding is, you probably also know how to modify it. Uh, okay. So so I wanna I wanna I wanna probe, given this choice of divisor d, this SNC divisor d, how does that you know what. How does the Hilbert scheme interact with that? Right? So, so a priori, that there's no relation whatsoever. The Hilbert scheme is constructed without reference to D. Um, but there's something interesting that happens that this divisor uh, determines kind of an interesting locus inside, uh, inside the Hilbert scheme of curves. Okay? Uh, and so, so the way I'll say it is, it's okay. So given a point, uh, given a point P, let's say in this, in this Hilbert scheme, I have a subscheme of X associated to that. Uh, and X, by virtue of endowing it with this divisor D, comes with a map to the stack AR mod GM to the R. Okay, so so if you know if if you're not used to thinking about stacks like this, uh, okay, it's it's a tautology. I don't know how to define a map to AR mod GM to the R except for telling you that there's uh, you know R irreducible Cartier divisors and, and I'm meeting in an SNC way. Okay, so so there there you go. Um, uh, okay, so so once you have this uh, once you have this map, you can ask for this composite map to be as nice as possible and as nice as possible in this context the right thing to ask ask it to do is for it to be flat right. so let me just uh, take a second to let's just take a second to think about what that ought to mean <clears throat> so uh, i want you know so this this thing should be uh, this thing should be one dimensional right? so so that that's that's my assumption and so let's take a look at uh, at, at at this gadget over here so so AR mod GM to the R, as far as I'm concerned, is just the set of orbits, right? It's just like a bunch of points. And some of those points have negative dimension. Right? So some of those points have positive dimensional stabilizers and, and I'll call those points, I'll, I'll say that those points have negative dimension just, just for talking about it. Um, and, uh, and it has one point, namely the origin, which, uh, which is where the entire interior uh, affects, namely X minus this, uh, this divisor D, it goes to that interior under this map, right? So if you're having trouble keeping track of the AR mod GM to the R here, I would just, I, you know, I, I suggest you assume that this divisor, each component of this divisor is principal and then you're just mapping to AR and everything I say is exactly right, uh, pretty much. Okay, so, so you have this map and I've asked for it to be flat. So what should that mean? Well, flatness implies lots of things, but one of, one of the things it ought to imply is, is equidimensionality, give or take. And so um, uh, what that should mean is that the, the origin here, which is a kind of zero dimensional point, right? so this is a zero dimensional object. So it, the zero dimensional point here 
uh, its preimage should be just a collection of points. Uh, there is a collection of points in here corresponding to orbits with a GM stabilizer. Right? So, so or, well, not or, yeah, orbits of AR under the GM action, GMR action with a GM stabilizer. So, so kind of co-dimension one points. Um, and, uh, and those co-dimension one points should have uh, zero dimensional preimages. And everything else should be kind of empty. Right? So everything else is, it should, should have negative dimensional fiber. Uh, and, and so that should certainly, uh, that should certainly be empty. So, uh, okay, so, so that's, that's roughly what flatness should give us. It should say that we should be looking at subschemes that meet the boundary divisor very nicely. So putting aside all of this kind of technical stuff, all I'm saying here is that uh, among other things, if I ask for this map to be flat, that picks out, a look, that picks out certain uh, subschemes, namely ones that meet the boundary divisor in finitely many points, okay? Or empty, but, but, but finitely many points. Okay, so this is a this is a this is a nice uh, this is a nice locus. It actually happens to be an open locus, and because it's a form of transversality, I'll just call it the transverse locus. Okay, so this is uh, Hild Hild knot is is what I'm calling the interior of the Hilbert scheme. Uh, so so x x you know with respect to d or x relative to d. Uh, this is exactly for me. This is defined to be the locus where this condition up here holds. This flatness condition holds. So it's just a bunch of points. Uh, it, it intersects the boundary in a bunch of points. That's not enough. The flatness is a little bit more than that, but I'll come to that in just a second. So, uh, of course, this is this is living inside the Hilbert scheme, and I can look at the universal subscheme uh, in inside there. And, and again, the, the point is that this map here, uh, this map here, is flat. Okay. So why why is this a good uh, condition to have? Why should one want to think about this naturally? I think there's a few different ways to answer that question. One answer is via these degeneration formulas that uh, that come up a lot, but I, I don't want to I don't want to kind of uh, uh, use that uh, today. Uh, so maybe one one a slightly different way you could motivate it is is really asking. So in this case, I'll ask x to be a threefold. Uh, let's say x is a threefold. So some kind of smooth. Okay, p three for for all I care, um, and. Um, uh, and, and so here, here's something that you can do on this locus. So uh, the Hilbert scheme uh, parameterizes some, you know, it, every point in the Hilbert scheme gives me an ideal. Right? I can take that ideal, I can and I can and I can solve it and get my subscheme. I can solve uh, its equation to get my subscheme. Uh, something else I could do is I could pick one of the pieces of my boundary, right? So in this cartoon picture here, I have two boundary divisors, d1 and d2. So r is equal to two. Uh, and if I if I've chosen this, uh, let's say I pick one of the I pick the first one, d1. Uh, I can take my ideal and I can solve it on D1, meaning I can solve the, all of the equations in, a, in that ideal plus you know, the, the equation of, of D1. And uh, one of the consequences of this flatness property is that you get the same number of points scheme theoretically every single time. Okay. So, so that's, that's uh, uh, a, a, another way of saying that is that on this locus, there's a way to take, um, uh, there, there's a way to take an ideal or an ideal sheaf and produce an ideal sheaf on a surface. Right? And, and that ideal sheaf on a surface will have the same length, right? So, or co-length, whatever. So it, it, it's vanishing locus will be the same number of points. Uh, scheme theoretic vanishing locus will be the same number of points every single time, provided you choose points on this thing. Right? So this is an open locus, it's non-compact, and that's some of the whole story here. But, but these evaluation maps, call them evaluation maps if you want, they take you from the Hilbert scheme of curves on a threefold to the Hilbert scheme of points uh, on a surface. And this is quite an appealing thing to do. So, so we, we know a lot about the Hilbert scheme of, of points on a surface. That, that's an incredibly rich object. It's, it's, um, its topology is controlled by modular forms. People understand its intersection theory very well. There's these relations to, 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 to Fox spaces and, and other cool representation theory. Uh, and it's, it's just a very, very rich and well-behaved object, it's smooth and projective. And, and, and okay, lots of people like studying this thing. And we know next to nothing about this Hilbert scheme of curves. And so it's just a way of, of kind of connecting the Hilbert scheme of curves to the Hilbert scheme of points on a surface, which is, which is maybe a worthwhile thing to try and do. Uh, okay, but that, that, that connection only works on this part for now. Right? <clears throat> so the ideal outcome, what we were trying to do in many ways is, um, uh, is to try and compactify this problem with this structure. So, so deciding that, you know, uh, it, it's a little funny, but, but, but I, I start off with this, this open moduli problem, the, 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 the Hilbert scheme of subschemes of X with this very nice transversality property to D. 
And I want to compactify that moduli problem subject to the condition of, of retaining this structure and also a bunch of virtual fundamental class uh, stuff that, that, that I won't, you know, I won't uh, rely on today. Okay, so, so that's the basic goal. And so the ideal outcome is, is exactly this. So I would, in, in, in a perfect world, there would be some kind of God-given moduli space, which I would call the logarithmic Hilbert scheme <clears throat> of curves. Uh, and it would come with evaluation maps to the logarithmic Hilbert scheme of points on a surface. <clears throat> and um, it's just, just to put the picture in mind, uh, you know, just as, just, uh, just uh, you know, every, if I have a simple normal crossings divisor, every, uh, every component in the boundary gives me in particular another, inherits another simple normal crossings divisor on it, right? just by intersecting with the rest of the stuff. Um, <clears throat> okay, good. So, um, so, so, so that would be my, my ideal outcome. Uh, and, uh, and at least to, to first approximation, and, and I just want to, to I, I'll build on this later, what this is gonna end up parameterizing are subschemes not just of X, but of certain target modifications of X, okay? So I'm gonna take X and I'm gonna do some surgery to it to replace it systematically to try and replace it with something larger that is willing to accommodate, um, uh, willing to accommodate limits uh, um, uh, of, of, of um, subschemes that have this transversality property, okay? So, so just to say the, the obvious thing here, the, the property that I, that I am, am kind of focusing in on this flatness is really not, um, it, it, it's very much not preserved under limits, right? So if I take a one parameter family, um, my, my, you know, if, I, if I have a one dimensional subscheme, then that subscheme might just fall all the way into the boundary. And then you know, I'm definitely not, uh, and you can see the number, the number of points has changed, but in particular, you can also see that the dimension of that map I wrote down earlier uh, also changes, this fiber dimension also changes. Okay, so, so I, th th that's basically gonna be the point of my talk is to try and explain this uh, construction. Okay, but I'm going to start with something that that might seem uh, at least somewhat unrelated, uh, which is just the idea of studying torus orbit closures. So, so from 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 my view, thinking about this this question, this is where this is where it all comes from. The idea really comes from studying torus orbit closures in uh, in Hilbert schemes. Okay, so there's a long history of this, I should say. Um, uh, for example, if, if there, you know, those of you who have attended talks on things like matroids or, or um, uh, yeah, okay, various other things, uh, uh, studying torus orbit closures in Grassmannians, for example, is a, is a, very, it's a very rich direction. Um, but, but, but really, I want to think a, a little bit about what torus orbit closures in Hilbert schemes look like. And, 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 and the reason I want to think about it is because it gives an answer to the following kind of simple question. So, I'm going to put myself in a situation where I just have a torus, an algebraic, an algebraic torus, and a subscheme in, inside of it, subvariety inside of it. And I'm going to ask the question: What is the best way to compactify this? And I'm going to insist that it's an equivariant compactification. So, what is the best toric compactification that's best adapted to this subscheme? Right. So. Um, yeah, so what is a good compact, what is, what is a good toric compactification of this GM to the R that, uh, you know, that is the place to study um, a, a closure of, of set naught? So what do I mean by good? I'm actually going to go back to the, 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 the transversality condition I had earlier. So good here is going to mean exactly the same thing, uh, which is that, so it's okay, all, almost exactly the same thing. So if I have a toric variety X, it comes also with a canonical map to, to something, which is uh, the toric variety mod its... Uh, it's, it's dense torus. So this is another zero dimensional um, kind of toric art and stack. Uh, and, and, and again, if, if X is S and C, this is again, basically just keeping track of the data of what the boundary divisors are. Okay, it's, it's a tiny bit more than that, but it's basically that. Uh, okay, so there's, um, uh, okay, so, 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 so that's my situation. Uh, so I have a sub scheme. Uh, uh, okay, so I have, I have, I have yikes, I'm erasing my talk. Okay, I have this uh, Z naught inside uh, GM to the R, so this interior thing, uh, and I want to compactify this to X uh, such that when I uh, look at the closure, say, of, of, of Z naught inside Z, the map from Z to this uh, Artin stack is flat. And again, it means exactly the same thing as it meant before. Uh, it, it means that when, you know, in this particularly fine compactification uh, of, of, the, of the algebraic torus, uh, this subscheme meets the boundary in as nice a way as possible. So if we're studying one-dimensional subschemes, 
it will meet the boundary in a bunch of points and a predictable number of points and how many points you just compute the intersection number of the curve class of that, of that one dimensional subscheme with the boundary class, which is all very concrete. And so uh, a couple of, a couple of um, things about this. So this, this flatness condition, one reason why it's nice is that it's actually stable under uh, further blow up. So if you find one such toric compactification, you found infinitely many just by blowing that thing up um, even more. Okay, so this is really a question about having a fine enough uh, compactification of a torus. Okay, so, so uh, you can ask this question and you can ask, okay, does this thing exist? Does this compactification exist? And then how would you, uh, constructed. Um, yeah. Is the is the question okay? Is the question clear? All right. So um, the answer comes from this really beautiful uh, theorem of Tevelov. Uh, so Tevelov's theorem. So so this this the roots of it are found in in a paper of uh, Kapranov, and then. Um, uh, Martin Ulrich generalized this to the kind of fully logarithmic setting, and then Walter Googler gives some kind of non-Archimedean generalizations of it. So anyway, lots of people have thought, thought about this thing, uh, but the construction is really cool, I think. So, so it's very simple. So you say, okay, I, I, I've started off with this uh, Zedna, and I'm trying to compactify X. So what's the best way to do it? Um, so first, just choose an arbitrary compactification of, uh, of, of this GM to the R. Just, just pick, um, uh, yeah. So, so just pick uh, any compactification of this GM to the R, say project space. Um, so what you can do then is, uh, okay, so, so, so close up uh, Z0 to get a subscheme of that, of that projective space. And now what you can do is this G, you can translate around. So this, this, this kind of Z will live inside this PR and you can translate around that Z by the, by the action of the algebraic torus. Right. So that, that's kind of a clever thing to do. So, what that does is it means that you have a map, okay, under mild conditions, which you can probably figure out, this map will be injective. So you have, 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 a, you, you, have, a, you, have a, you have an embedding of GM to the R into the Hilbert scheme of PR, right? Basically by using this Z naught as some kind of pivot, right? you just hold on to that and you swing it around by the torus. And because you know, every time it translates, it gives you a different subscheme of the Hilbert scheme, uh, you end up putting the entire torus into, into the Hilbert scheme. It's really quite a clever, Construction. So, if 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 any of you have thought about things like Chow quotients or Hilbert quotients, uh, this is exactly the same kind of construction that we use. We're just using them in a different context. Okay. So so that's uh, step one, and and then you you take the closure of your algebraic torus inside this thing. Okay. And then you normalize it, and that's going to be a toric variety, and I'll call that Y. And then it's essentially just a diagram chase from there. I think the hard part is really having the idea. Uh, it, it's essentially a diagram chase that the, 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 in, in this toric variety that you actually, it's kind of funny, it, you used Z0 to get it. And in this toric variety that Z0 tells you to compactify GM to the R2, this flatness property is exactly the thing that's satisfying. It's quite a, I don't know, I think I, I find this quite kind of, uh, kind of uh, clever. It's, it feels like a, yeah. yeah sure. right, right, right. So what you're saying is that you wanted this thing to be flat. You just took the thing with parameter twice as flat things. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and there you go. And then, then yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, so this, you can do this in lots of other, so, so one, one thing you can think about is, well, there's other contexts in which you can try to do this. Maybe you replace the Hilbert scheme with the space of stable maps or, um, or you, you replace it with uh, the Chow variety and you get something else um, uh, that, that's maybe less well-behaved, but more computable. Maybe you replace it with the moduli space of branch varieties. There's just tons of things that you can do um, to, to get different kind of very nice compactifications uh, yep. in this way. So yeah, I, I think it's a very, yeah, it's a very clever construction. Okay. Uh, so, mm -hmm. I, a question from Chad is, is this, is this compactification universal or reversal in any sense? No, yeah, so I'll come to this. It's not, the, 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 you, you run into this kind of, the, the, there's a big choice here. So even if I decided that I wanted to compactify the GM to the R to PR, there's tons of ways to do that. Um, because I can choose uh, different ways to view the torus inside uh, inside projective space. So yeah, essentially no, it's not it's not canonical. It's not universal. It's it's nothing. It it it's just good enough for this for this problem. But that will actually good enough be good enough for for our problem as well once we remember what it is. Okay. Uh, so so I just I still I, I do want to give you a sense for what this thing looks like. So I'll rely on some toric dictionary stuff for this. Uh, and, and this is actually where, I mean, the tropical geometers have known about this theorem for a very long time. 
Um, uh, so this is the context in which Tevelev studied it. His paper is called Tropical Compactifications of Subvarieties of Tauri. Um, and so it, this gives you a sense for what this thing actually looks like, or maybe some kind of other way that you might think about it. Um, so uh, how, how do you compute it? Um, okay, so, so this, this, this thing here, why? Uh, it's, a, it's a toric compactification of GM to the R. Right? So as far as I'm concerned, this is purely combinatorial data, uh, which is, it's just a fan, uh, it's, it's just a fan structure on some kind of vector space. Right? So it's just equivalent to this information. Okay, so if, if you've been thinking about toric varieties for a few weeks and you know what this is, that's great. If you don't, it's okay. It's a dictionary that you can go and look up. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm just gonna tell you what that fan is, some kind of polyhedral object. And, um, and I'm gonna tell you how to get it out of Z naught. Okay, so the thing you're gonna do is, uh, you're, let's say you're working over the complex numbers to start, you're gonna base change to some absolutely absurd field, like um, basically, you know, C adjoin T to the, you know, the power series with real exponents, give or take. That's not actually a thing, but, but power series with re real exponents with well-ordered support is good enough. Okay. So, so that's a huge field and it has a valuation just by given by order of vanishing of the power series. Uh, and that valuation is uh, surjective onto the real numbers. So this is, uh, this is, you can just base change to this field and you can look at um, the map that in some sense fibers the K points of this algebraic torus onto R to the R, right? Which is basically, yeah, it's the same thing as this, this NR that I wrote earlier. So this is just some math, the coordinate wise valuation. There's nothing sophisticated here. And so I take Z naught and I apply this tropicalization map. So this is called the tropicalization map. I just apply this thing and I get something. So it's a, it's a theorem from the eighties by Beery and Gross that this thing that you get is a polyhedral complex or actually it's a fan, right? And this fan is almost exactly the right thing. Okay, so uh, you remember back, back then I said uh, flat, Right, so I want these maps to be flat. I want this thing to be flat over the zero dimensional art and stack. If I replace that flat, that word flat with just equidimensional, then this is literally the right thing. Okay, so that gap between equidimensional and flat is something you have to contend with, but okay, one can do it. Um, and so that's it, right? So you just compute this thing and that's the fan and that's the, that's the whole story, right? So, so this fan, which is computed, okay. Anytime we say something is defined by closure, it's a way of saying, I have no idea what this thing is. Um, but here, I'm actually telling you at least another way of, of thinking about it, okay? And, and if you go and dig into, so this is actually a relatively concrete process. Uh, if you had equations, say, for Z0 in the algebraic torus, you could compute this using Grobner theory, right? So in principle, you could do this using a computer, and there are people that spend their lives um, making that better and better, okay? So if, you're, if you've seen tropical talks, then, then you've seen pictures like these before. Uh, these are... This is where these pictures come from, right? But the content in there is that this fan, this, this polyhedral, okay, but this is not a fan, but the cone over it is. Um, uh, so I'm just slicing the picture. Uh, so the, these fan structures, they are the right fan structures for this kind of question. Right? So that's exactly the data that they encode is, um, is yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if, I, if I pick a fan structure that's supported on this, I'm likely to have a very good compactification. Um, I wanted to say something here. Uh, I've forgotten it. Ah, yes, uniqueness. Um, so this, this, uh, there's just a basic fact here, which is that the, the tropicalization, the image, this image here, uh, it, it, it was, uh, so Bieri and Groves were able to sh show that this is the support of a polyhedral complex. It's by no means unique. Okay, so, um, and this can be in mild way, it can be non-unique in some mild ways, for example, uh, R2, the vector space, has no minimal polyhedral decomposition, no canonical polyhedral decomposition. Um, but uh, uh, it, it can be it can be um, it can be non-unique in some slightly more sophisticated ways as well. I'll point to that uh, later on. Right? But 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 so far there's just this construction and it, it outputs. Um, well, although, although so far the way you describe it, you said it's a support of a polyhedral complex. You don't seem to care what the polyhedral complex is. Yeah, right? that's right. So that's right. So any so the exactly. support's unique, but you just it's just the polyhedral. Yeah, complex. exactly. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so as I'll say later on, the support being unique is somehow a logarithmic. It's a, it's a statement that saying that the support of a polyhedral complex is unique is saying that you want to allow yourself to change things by subdivisions. You want to basically invert the class of subdivisions, and that's something that 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 log geometry tells you to do all over the place. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, as well as yeah. 
so other other reasons to do that. Okay, so so how how is this how is this relevant to this old problem? So maybe I should go back and say what that old problem was. Um, uh, I don't know about uh, I don't know about you folks, but my attention span has been kind of uh, garbage since the pandemic. So let me remind you. Um, the idea was inside the Hilbert scheme, the presence of this divisor gave me a, a kind of interesting subscheme, an interesting locus of subschemes where the universal, um, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, interesting locus of points where the universal subscheme was flat over this tautological thing that I get from the existence of the divisor, and I want to compactify that, right? So, so where is this related? Uh, it, it's, it's, it becomes very related if you just squint at it, right? Okay, so uh, that that space, that open locus in the Hilbert scheme, was not compact, right? It's not a proper, um, it's not a proper thing. Uh, and so um, let's, let's think about what that means. It, it means that, that I don't have a way to, in particular, I, I, I can't complete the value of criterion for properness, among other things. Right? So, so, um, so let's think about what that means. If I have, let's say, say delta naught for me is some kind of disk. And so let's say this is a DVR, spec of, spec of a valued field. Um, then um, let's say I take a family of subschemes over this disk in here, and say at you know at on you know here they all satisfy this uh, transversality property. Okay, so this delta is really uh, mapping mapping to this thing. It's living inside that thing. Okay. And I want to know you know the, the the limit of this thing might fall out of Hild naught. That's the non properness, and so I, I want to figure out how to fill it in. Now if you just squint at this the right way, so so let me try and draw the analogy for you and then I'll tell you how to you know how, how people yeah, worry about this stuff. Um, so uh, if you just squint at this the right way, um, so you have an interior which uh, okay so what I want to what I want to think about is for a second x cross d sorry x rel d uh, crossed with um, delta which is actually the spec of my DVR. So in some sense, this is its interior. Well, this is its interior, All right? So I wanna think about this thing uh, and I have something that seems to live in its interior, which is this subscheme. So this subscheme is going to play the role, uh, the generic fiber is going to play the role of, uh, of Z naught in this play. And, uh, and this thing, or uh, okay, the torus is going to be played by uh, you know, x, x rel d, okay, x cross delta naught, which is kind of an open and dense in here. Uh, and then I'm just gonna run this game, okay? Now, you should complain for various reasons. This is not an algebraic torus. Uh, there's no torus action, all of that stuff. Uh, the, the, there, there's, okay, this is, the, the, I'm, I don't wanna spend a ton of time on this. Uh, and I think that's also not where the fun geometry is. So uh, how does one fix that in any case? Well, um, this thing here is uh, an SNC pair, right? Because this is an SNC pair and this is a, okay, that's a, that's a, that's a curve with a divisor. And so the product is certainly an SNC pair. Uh, and, SNC, you may want to define SNC. Oh yeah, sorry, I should have said that before. Yeah, simple normal crossings. Um, uh, so what I mean by this is I have a, I'll, I'll say that X, X rel D is an SNC pair if X is a, um, yeah, let's just say a smooth variety and D is a, um, uh, is a Cartier divisor and it's irreducible components when they meet, meet like hyperplanes and locally like uh, uh, coordinate planes in affine space, right? So uh, that's, uh, yeah. So, so the, the examples to keep in mind are any smooth toric variety, it's boundary divisor, the complement of its uh, interior is a bunch of irreducible uh, co-dimension one subvarieties and they meet in, in, the nice, in the nicest possible way. That smoothness is, is what's making it SNC. Um, yeah, the coordinate planes is obviously the best thing to look at. So anything that looks like coordinate planes in some, some affine space of some dimension uh, is good enough uh, for us. Okay, so uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully that's okay. Um, uh, okay, so, so, so I'm, I'm now in this situation where um, I have this, this variety. Okay, I'll think of its total space as just being a thing. Uh, and I have this, this, yeah, this, this SNC pair, this, this variety with the simple normal crossings boundary divisor. Uh, given by uh, you know, uh, 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 yeah, the, the the special fiber, and then all of the divisors coming from uh, uh, yeah, d cross uh, delta and zero cross x. So those are the two divisors, and they and they meet nicely. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, the the key point is that near every boundary divisor, 
in a, in, a, in a kind of a formal neighborhood of every boundary device, the situation actually does look toric. And because you can do Grobner theory kind of formally uh, in, you know, in the formal power series ring, that's good enough to, to translate those toric, to translate those toric statements into, uh, into statements in, uh, in algebraic, uh, in, in, yeah, in this, this kind of more general statement. Uh, okay, so, so, so you can all find all of this in, uh, among other places in, uh, I believe it's Martin Ulrich's first paper. It's called something like tropical compactification and log regular growth. It's very, very nice, uh, very nice paper. Uh, okay, so, um, so what does that mean? It means that I should end up with right, something that is a modification, it's a blow up of um, X cross, uh, yeah, cross delta. Right. So what is, what is a modification of X cross delta? Well, X cross delta on its own is the trivial family, right? It's a trivial family of X. And so if I blow up, essentially what I'm doing is, uh, is, is, is changing the special fiber by, by, yeah, by blowing it up. So I add a bunch of new components to the special fiber. I'll show you an example in just a second. Uh, okay, so the, the output uh, okay, of, of this construction is that you get a flat family, a flat limit of your variety that satisfies all of the nice transversality properties that you would want, okay? I want us to think a tiny bit about what that is, but, but, uh, but it essentially looks like the following. So in the general fiber, I started with this nice, uh, this nice guy, right? So X, uh, X with its boundary divisor, the, the, the Z is, is, my, uh, is my sub scheme and it meets the boundary uh, very, very transversely, very nicely. And, um, uh, and the special fiber is now, it, it's, it's some kind of blow up. Right? Uh, and, it has lots of components in principle. So for example, uh, yeah, when we do an example of deformation in the normal cone, you'll, 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 have a, you'll have a concrete one, but it has lots of, um, it lots of components and each of those components has divisors of its own. And the limit of this subscheme breaks when it hits the special fiber. When it hits the special fiber, um, it not only breaks, the different pieces in the different components, they meet their individual divisors transversely and they, and they, they match up in the, in, in, yeah, they, they, they match up at the creases, okay? So, uh, so all I've done here essentially is translate the, 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 the statement um, uh, somewhere, yeah, on, 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 on this slide, right? So I've translated this statement about this flatness into what that means on, on the special fiber. Right? So I just make that translation and, uh, and I end up with, a, with, with an, the nicest possible uh, compactification. So, so if you think about this, what this tell, okay, the, the way we viewed this is you look at this theorem and it, it, it seems to be telling you, or you look at this construction, it seems to be telling you the kind of the hard half of uh, the, the hard part of a proof of the value of criterion for a moduli space that we haven't built yet. And so the idea was just to go and build that thing. And surely if we can build that thing, that thing has to be the right thing, okay? So this, these, these objects that we get in this way, namely by uh, taking X and crossing it with, uh, with um, something like a DVR, and then blowing up its strata and the special fiber, uh, those are things that we call expansions. Right? Uh, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll explain what that is uh, a, a little bit more in a second, okay? Um, but the, the, the strategy then to construct these moduli spaces becomes, okay, I, my, 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 my objects from this picture are gonna, in order to name one, uh, what, what data am I gonna have to give you? I'm gonna have to give you one of these expansions of X. So, a, a, Know, like a, a bunch of irreducible varieties that are glued together uh, that, 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 that are built from X and, its, uh, and, and the divisors and, and X its divisor and the intersection of the components of its divisor and so on. So the strata of X, uh, X rel D. Uh, so I need to give you that kind of broken variety. And I also need to give you a subscheme in that. Now, thankfully the, the technology for proving that um, you know, Hilbert schemes are representable in reasonable generality is kind of absurd already. So, so we, didn't, we don't have to do any, any work on that front. So putting in the last part, putting in the subscheme is straightforward. Um, the trickier part is knowing what the right class of um, targets is to study, right? And again, the idea was that it should be told to us by the output of this Tevla of construction. Um, okay, maybe I'll pause for a second. Is there other questions? So, so great. So if Tevlev tells us, so to figure out what that's got to be, you want a polyhedral decomposition, you think. That's right. And you're not that's getting right. that. You're just getting this support of the polyhedral decomposition. Yeah, that's right. That, that's, already, that's already one issue and it'll, it'll come up in a second. Uh, and yeah, so, so even knowing that we want polyhedral um, 
you know, polyhedral structures, polyhedral subcomplexes inside uh, the fan of X or inside some vector space, even knowing that I need to parameterize that and then turn that into algebraic geometry somehow. And that's, that's what I'll explain now. Okay, so, uh, so, so the goal is to construct some kind of stack. So I wanna construct some kind of stack, I'll call it X for expansions of XD, which, which means expansions of X along D. Uh, and whatever it is, it should come with a universal family so it, it should come with a universal expansion. Okay. So every possible expansion, and I still haven't told you what one of those is, but, but I'll, I'll explain it in the second half of this slide. Um, every single one of those expansions should somehow, you know, anything that I could need uh, from the output of that Tevelev construction should be parameterized by this thing. Uh, and it should have a universal family and a contraction map down to X. Right? Because it's going to, at least the way I presented it, it, it has, um, it's, it's a blow up of the trivial family. So it should be, you should be able to contract it down to X. Uh, that thing is that that piece of structure is convenient at least. Uh, okay, so how do we build an expansion? Um, this is somehow where the tropical uh, point of view is just somehow very really clean. So uh, an expansion of the target geometry is basically combinatorial uh, data. So I start off with with uh, x relative to d, and from it I can build uh, I can build a fan, right? So um, uh, again, if you if you know about fans of toroidal embeddings, that's that's exactly what I mean here. Uh, if not, uh, here's a quick definition: is that I I first form a simplicial complex whose vertices are the components of the divisor and whose edges are the pairwise intersections and whose uh, two-dimensional faces are the triple intersections and so on and so forth. So I form that simplicial complex and then I just take the cone over it to turn it into a fan. Okay, so that's all. Now I've given up on X completely. Right? So X is X is now out of the picture. I've just built this kind of additional piece of uh, combinatorics. So this is gone. Uh, and so the next thing I do is I build kind of the combinatorial trivial fan, meaning I take this fan, which, which I just told you how to build and I cross it with uh, R positive and I look at the projection map down to R positive, that's all. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I subdivide this thing, meaning I refine the polyhedral structure uh, on, on this product. So there's a lot more ways of refining the polyhedral structure on the product than there are um, on, on, on sigma itself. So that's worth keeping in mind. But, but, but basically, I'm, uh, you know, if, if you think about this as just being a simplicial complex, I'm just, I'm just subdividing in the way that you learn in a, in a kind of algebraic topology course, right? You just add a bunch of vertices and you connect it by a bunch of other stuff. And yeah, you hope it's a simplicial complex. So that's all this is, right? And then I look at the induced projection down to, uh, down to x. And then there's this toric dictionary. And so what this toric dictionary will do is it'll say, okay, uh, if you, um, it, it basically just says that there's a corresponding modification of the trivial family, um, kind of X cross uh, A1 over A1. So there's some modification of that trivial family and that produces one of these guys. So it's a, it's a family over A1 and then I just restrict to the special fiber and anything I can get out of this kind of, you know, co purely combinatorial process, uh, I will call an expansion. Right, so, so I've only given, to you, given them to you over spec C at this point, right? just one at a time. And so building this is, is yeah, still not completely clear how to build this object, but at least we've turned it into a pure combinatorics problem where all I need to tell you is, all I need to do is parameterize the possible um, ways in which I can subdivide uh, this thing, right? the, 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 the different hey. possible subdivisions. Cool. Yeah. Hey, may I ask you a question? Yes, please. So, uh, so here, so you have the fun, right? You take the tropicalization of this X with device, you get fun, and you take the trivial family, right? But in your case, I think uh, your situation is pretty good, right? It's just uh, uh, the variety with a simple normal crossing, right? And, uh, and I think the, the tropicalization doesn't have any like um, sort, of, sort of like a monodromy, right? It's actually monodromy free, right? Yeah. That's case. right. So there's nothing complicated about this. This is literally just the cone over a simplicial complex. It's a totally elementary object. And I'm just subdividing it after adding a direction. Okay, so why am I adding this direction? In case you know, in, in case you find this uh, confusing, I'm adding this direction because when you blow up, you turn everything into a you, you know, you turn whatever you blow up into a Cartier divisor. Yeah. Uh, and if you uh, if you add this trivial direction, then you turn everything you turn whatever you blow up into a component. Right. Uh, but in this case, like, uh, and so my first question was sort of like, uh, is there any possible we can embed this tropicalization into some Euclidean space? Because it's monodromic free. So is it possible? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's basically yeah. right. So in fact, I, I sort of implicitly did that uh, already. Um, yeah. But you, you, you don't need, yeah, one doesn't need to do that. Um, right, right. Because one, like one saw this kind of, once we can put that in uh, some Euclidean space and then we, we can add one more kind of like a uh, dimension around that we put the tropicalization at the height one kind of level and then we take Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's exactly the right picture. Yeah. Okay, exactly. great. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, all right. Okay, so I wanted to show you a, a, just a small example of this so that it, 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 you can at least convince yourself that you can go and look this up. So I'll start off with P2 and I'll take my kind of Cartier divisor to be two lines. So P2 and the boundary divisor is exactly two lines. Uh, so it looks, I don't know, something like that, at least on my head. Uh, and, um, and so what, what is this procedure going to look like? Okay, I've drawn it here with the subscheme. Uh, so the subscheme here, when I compute its tropicalization will look like this thing. Well, maybe it might, it might look like that. Right? So it might look like the, 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 the kind of tripod embedded in this, uh, in this uh, uh, R2 positive. Uh, and again, really I'm drawing slices here. So, so it's really the cone over this picture, but it's okay. Uh, and, so, uh, and so if I run this through my toric dictionary, what you end up with is exactly the deformation to the normal cone of this point in, uh, in P2. Main, right. Namely, you cross with uh, A1 and you blow up, uh, the, you blow up this, uh, you, you blow up this corner point uh, over the special fiber of, of A1. I think sometimes it's hard to see what you're pointing at there. Or maybe... Oh, sorry. Maybe I'll change to red. That's more dramatic color. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. So, so I'm blowing up this point, but after adding this trivial direction. And so instead of, uh, instead of turning this point into a P1, I turn it into a P2 and glue it off. So, so this, this in particular captures deformation to the normal cone, but it captures a lot of other stuff as well that, that you would get by, you know, kind of slightly more, um, uh, yeah, not, yeah, not slightly more, much more exotic uh, subdivision. So, so uh, if you're more a uh, kind of algebra geometric thinker, uh, you know, at least the project, you know, there's a class of, okay, so, so um, there's at least a class of uh, projective subdivisions, which is quite a large class, uh, which is what you get by, so given one of these uh, divisors, the equations that cut out the divisor, I can treat them as monomials. And then I can take any ideal that's generated by monomials, these, these equations that cut out the divisor, uh, and I can uh, do, a, do a blow up, right? So that, those, can be quite, uh, those can be quite complicated. Right? So an arbitrary, just, you know, an arbitrary projective morphism basically is a, is a blow up. This is some kind of monomial version of that. Um, okay. Um, so cool. I ask a question. Yeah. So so basically you just so this procedure kind of just resolves resolves this the question that like whenever you have a curve right, or like a shift like a, like a, like a curve picture is whenever you like a curve and then meeting the sort of like intersection point like a singular okay. locus of the divisor right and then you mm -hmm. you want kind of stretch that singular point to something and the, so that you can really just uh, make Absolutely. it like or something right. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly that's exactly the picture. And so, for example, the subscheme here that hopefully you can now see me pointing to, uh, it it might be traveling in a in a forbidden direction towards this corner. And what I've done is essentially said, okay, I'm going to replace. I'm going to give myself a little room to accommodate the movement of the subscheme. Uh, and now maybe the subscheme breaks into a piece there and a piece there, but the both pieces are now transverse. So this is the idea. Uh, and so what do I need to parameterize? I need to parameterize this graph. I need to parameterize things like this. That's basically what I have to do. I have to parameterize this graph and, uh, uh, and, and, and things like it. Okay, so but in, the, this, but in this case, do you, get, do you end up with a family of curves eventually? Like because you, you, you kind of do expansion, right? Expand the point, right? And the, it seems like you have so many choices. Whenever you have the more strata, right? You have so many choices of like, tendency order along the boundaries, something? Uh, no, so everything is determined by the generic fiber. So oh, okay. all, all, yeah, so, so, so remember these are gonna be flat limits. And so, oh. so you can tell a lot about what the special fiber is, is gonna look like in terms of that kind of information. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, so what's the strategy? Uh, it's actually kind of naive now. So, so um, we say, okay, I wanna parameterize these things. I should be able to do it. You know, I'll, I'll uh, you know, just as I, you know, I can, you know, I can, I can parameterize, uh, you know, sub varieties of projective space using a projective scheme. So, so why can't I parameterize, you know, well, one dimensional 
uh, sub, um, you know, metric graphs, if you like, embedded inside some fixed uh, vector space or some fixed fan. Uh, so maybe there's some moduli space of these things. And this is just going to be some kind of moduli cone complex. Right? So it's just, you, you, okay, we, we're going to try and parameterize this somehow. And then if we've parameterized it right, hopefully it'll come with a universal family, which is really a universal subdivision of sigma. That's the trick. That's the hope. Uh, and uh, hopefully this thing is just given by um, taking a bunch of cones and gluing them together. Okay. And if that's the case, then, um, th th okay, this looks, uh, this looks pretty good. And there's, a, there's, a, there's kind of a cheap way to convert this into an art instead. And namely what you do is, okay, when I say it's glued by cone, glued um, from cones, I mean that there's some diagram and I take a co-limit of a bunch of cones, right? But then I can just translate this into a diagram where I take a co-limit, essentially with the same indexing, uh, but I take the kind of toric variety associated to that cone modulo its dense torus. So this is some kind of cheap trick. And so every time you see, you know, if you, every time you see an orthant, for example, you just replace that with an mod gm to the n, and every time you know orthants are glued together, you you glue them, you glue the an mod gm to the n. It's a perfect bijection, right? So the gluing on one side gives you gluing on the other side. So, so this, is, this is a really, I mean, it, it, for such a simple idea, it's, a very, it's a kind of amazing how influential this has been for, for those of us to think about this. So, so it, was, it was introduced in this paper of, uh, of Jonathan and, and Dan Abramovich, uh, well, Jonathan Wise and Dan Abramovich. Uh, yeah, anyway, in case there was any confusion. Uh, and then there's also a really nice perspective on this by uh, Chan Cavalieri, Ulrich and Wise. Kind of a long and very readable paper. Um, okay. So that's the strategy. So you just you, you just try and build this thing, and you hope it's you know you hope it's given with this in this way, and then that's it. You're you're home and dry, and, and maybe that's X. Uh, and and there's only one problem with this, which is that this hope just is just not true. So this is just a false statement that at least as far as we can tell, this uh, this co this thing, which you can okay. So one can make a precise definition of what this is. It's supposed to be a certain functor on the set of polyhedral on the okay. On the, uh, it's a it's a functor on polyhedral complexes category. Uh, and, uh, and you can hope that that functor is representable by a cone complex and it's just not, okay? And it's actually quite easy to say why it's not. It has a lot to do with the fact uh, from earlier that there's no minimal polyhedral complex structure on a given polyhedral set, okay? So the key example, which drove us crazy for a while is, is just the following, where you imagine that you're trying, so whatever this thing is, okay, may maybe at this point in the talk, you're not, you're not following exactly what T sigma XD should be, but it should, I'm, I'm telling you now, it should contain the set of embedded graphs in, let's say, R3 positive. And so R3 positive, some orthon, it should contain the set of kind of metric embedded graphs, so one dimensional polyhedral subcomplexes of that thing. Uh, and then you run into this kind of funny phenomenon, which are not, they're sort of reminiscent of what happens in the Hilbert scheme, where you have these moduli spaces. Uh, yeah, so, okay, so look, let me say, say the combinatorial version you have, uh, let's say, edges um, in, in three space, and, and because they can be skew, they can move and hit each other kind of in the interior. And when you see what this does to the universal family, just make sure that the universal family can't be represented, right? It's a little bit like trying to turn, uh, so, so one so, learns- Can you say that again in, in, with the geometry? Can you give more details about that or say what about happened? the geometry thing? That's right. Uh, with the yeah, I, I just have, I mean, you know, maybe this is a, maybe this is a false analogy, but to me, it's very close to the idea of, you know, if you have um, you know, a, a, a twisted cubic in P3, then that can degenerate into a nodal planar cubic, but then you've lost, some, you know, you, you have some, you have some, there's something weird about that phenomenon because you need to have this embedded point, which can then float around. And so, okay, yeah. that, feels, that feels, so it feels like a, it, that seems like a very rough analogy rather than a yeah that's, that that is a rough analogy that is a, that's definitely just a rough analogy but 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 in the same way that you know if you try to just form the limit with uh, without that embedded point the universal family would kind of not be right in the same way if you look at this family where you have kind of a one parameter family of these skew edges that that degenerate so to speak into something that meets in the interior so you have a new vertex in your polyhedral uh, uh, set um, uh, yeah, yeah the, the the universal family here just is not yeah it's just not representable by a cone complex. Right? So this is just an issue. Um, yeah, so 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 practically it, it comes from this fact that there's no kind of minimal or canonical uh, polyhedral, or the consequence of it rather is that there's no canonical uh, such structure. Okay, but it actually works out in the end. Uh, so so what it means so it's a little bit like so so as um, as a much better analogy because this can, this one can actually be made precise. Um, 
if you if you open up Fulton's textbook and Torque Varieties and you read what his definition of a cone is, he has all of these adjectives, strongly convex, rational polyhedral, something, something. And if you start dropping some of those, like if you drop strongly convex cones, so if you try to make a cone out of the entire real plane or something, or the, the two-dimensional plane, then if you try to build a toric variety out of that, it wouldn't work. And it's the same reason, you know, that, that that's telling you that that functor is not representable. And then the same thing is, is happening here, exactly. So, um, so, so yeah, it's the same, some of the same phenomena. Okay, so, so nonetheless, it, it kind of works out. Uh, what it means is that the logarithmic Hilbert scheme, at least its scheme theoretic incarnation doesn't exist. So there is actually an infinite collection of spaces, which are these uh, spaces of expansions, and they're all birational. And actually, every single one, there is no unique one, but every single one is good enough to build a logarithmic, Hil logarithmic Hilbert scheme over. Okay. So there's just a whole bunch of these, and there's a whole bunch of, of corresponding, uh, you know, th these choices match up exactly. There's a, there's a bunch of corresponding Hilbert schemes of uh, logarithmic Hilbert schemes of curves. Uh, in XD, but other than this one kind of annoyance, um, they uh, they nonetheless uh, they nonetheless kind of give you um, uh, um, they, yeah they give you exactly the, the the structure that that we were hoping to see. Uh, well, I see. That. But what's the functor? What's the what's the? Yeah, yeah, great. So you pick this. So yeah, so so this is one. Yeah, okay. So the the functor uh, is easy to specify on logarithmic schemes because it's expansions together with some property. So the property is that the log structure on the base is constrained by the polyhedral choice that you make in buildings, okay? And then you can turn that into a functor on schemes in exactly the same way um, that, uh, that you look at. It's, it seems completely okay to have it on log schemes. Like that seems not less the issue, but, yeah, once right. have, but once you have it on log schemes, you're telling me that the choice is gone or that there's- the choice, is not, the choice is not gone. It just, it has a modular interpretation. It has a modular interpretation, which is, you know, that that uh, it's those it's um it the it has a modular interpretation with a polyhedral choice built in. But, but so, so 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 in effect, you're is what you're saying that you have what a family is. You have isomorphisms, new isomorphisms in your families. That uh, yeah, that, 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 that uh, is that, that is that is that, is that how I want to say it? Um, I'd have to think about that. I'm not sure that that's how I want to say it. Yeah, uh, but but yeah, but um, uh, yeah. So over, oh, it's, it's, yeah. So in, it, it's true that its universal property is now a little bit more delicate, where you have to, in addition, so you, you don't just get to build uh, an expansion of the target uh, and then say that this is, you know, this has a moduli map. Uh, you have to basically, okay, you you have to build that and then check the logarithmic structure and see essentially if it's small enough. And that, that notion of small enough is, is, give, is exactly this choice. And there's a question from Jat saying, what exactly are lambdas? That was at the top of the page. Yeah, yeah, okay. So lambda is a polyhedral choice and it's a choice of, of polyhedral structure on this set. Yeah, so it's just... And is there something if you refine too much, then... Oh. That gets no, there's, there's, yeah, there's no issue with refining too much. And if you're willing to leave, uh, you know, leave algebraic varieties, or you know, leave leave uh, algebraic stacks, then you can take an inverse limit in a not so dangerous way, and then just work formally there. So with like expanded degenerations, when you just have like one divisor which doesn't meet any other divisors, then somehow there's like a unique minimal run, that's right? True. But somehow that's exactly right. That's somehow right. the the further subdivisions never arise there. That's why I'm wondering whether yeah. So the further subdivisions never arise, but nonetheless, there's actually um, yeah, there's actually a choice there as well. Actually, let me, before I continue answering that, so should I kind of end now and then go for questions or should I try and finish the, what, yeah, what, what, totally why, fine. Why, why, why don't we always let people go if they have to, but you want yeah, to, yeah. But, but maybe uh, it's good to have like a sharp break between ending and questions. So do you want to go a bit more and then conclude? Yeah, sure. And then, yeah, I, I, then we'll declare it over and then we'll have questions. Is that great? Right, yeah, okay. Okay, so 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 maybe I'll just run through the rest of my slides really quick. They're mostly uh, they're mostly um, just words anyway. Um, okay, so so the, the the takeaway is that the logarithmic Kelvin scheme, at least for curves, seems to seems to exist, provided you learn this lesson that you're supposed to invert this class of morphisms, namely uh, the subdivisions. So this has come up in other places. So so the logarithmic version of the multiplicative group and the logarithmic version of the Picard group are both instances of of functors that are not actually well-defined, you know, sorry, they're not representable um, uh, by a scheme with a logarithmic structure or a stack with a logarithmic structure even, 
um, but uh, but if you invert a class of morphisms, then they are. Okay. So, okay, so really, you are making new isomorphisms. That's what you. I mean, that's what inverting class. Ah, uh, yes, yes. If you yes, yeah. If, if that's if that's what you mean by that statement, then yes, definitely. I'm I'm inverting the class of blowups, and and then that's exactly. Uh, yeah, that's exactly giving me the the longer than the Kilbert scheme. Okay, so so for what it's worth, let me just say what what you know what we ended up doing with this. So there exists these logarithmic Hilbert schemes. They 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 you know they come as advertised. Uh, they're not unique, but it doesn't end up mattering because the only piece of structure that we need from it right now, at least, uh, is is this virtual fundamental class. Which uh, when you make when you make choices, you know you don't really change the virtual fundamental class in the sense that if you make a different choice, there's always kind of a a, a common refinement where you can compare them. Uh, and 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 from the from the point of view of enumerative geometry, this doesn't affect anything. Um, uh, okay, so that's uh, that's. So at this point, you're changing the log. Okay, wait. So at this point, you have a new category. You have the category yeah. of log, log varieties or stack, if you want to. Uh, and then now you're making now you're inverting these things, which are etal and like uh, and that's, that's right. Logarithmically etal maps. Right. Yeah. So if you like, I'm changing the topology. I, I I want I want to work in this log etal topology. Um, no, no, but you're changing the. I mean, you're making new isomorphisms, right? I mean, you really are. Allowing new objects. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Sure. I think there's a so there's a. Uh, Jonathan, oh, I was just going to say, working in the log H topology does that. It inverts. Yeah, yeah, ex exactly. So I, I think there's a few different ways formally to get to organize it, but but. Um, Inverting morphisms means that's a new morphism that was not there before. So the, the log H topology is not subcanonical, so so it ah. it, it makes. Oh, okay. Similar. You're just okay. That's crazy talk. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, okay, I should say, you know, on that. Okay, maybe I'll maybe I'll save this for later. Okay, so so this is where we were. This is where you know this is this is this is what we managed to build. Build. I won't I won't say much about those things. I do want to say that there's there's actually you know uh, th this is somewhat we rediscovered a whole bunch of stuff um, and 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 you know put it in a in a more general maybe slightly more general context for our purposes. But it's really it, this stuff has been coming up for a really long time, uh, and it's it's been sort of cool that you know ever, ever since we wrote the paper, I keep finding it in new places. So. So, uh, okay, so first I should say that, you know, a, a huge motivation for this, even if not the technical details, but was this work of Abramovich, Chen, Gross, Siebert um, on the logram of Witten side. Uh, we end up redoing what they do. We cannot do it the same way, but when we run our construction in Gromov Witten theory, it actually gives something and it gives, it gives exactly, essentially it gives exactly the same thing. And this allows us to set up these, these proposed Gromov Witten DT conjectures in this log setting. But this actually goes, this, th these ideas go far along, go, go back a long way. So in, instead of curves on a threefold, if you think about curves on a surface, you should end up with some version of, the, of a linear system. And if you do this on a toric variety, what we end up constructing are the secondary polytopes and secondary toric varieties that were studied in, 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 in this GKZ book. Um, Laforgue's uh, compactification of thin Schubert cells from his uh, you know, monograph uh, ends up being you know, essentially our strategy, but but you run it on the Grassmannian. So you started the Hilbert scheme of, of planes um, in, in projective space, and and then hacking Kiel and Tevelev, um, which okay, this actually did serve for me as, as, as a big piece of motivation. Um, you know, their their work on on moduli of Telpezos and and on moduli of hyperlane arrangements also follows a very similar strategy. And in each case, people are doing the work in different ways. But but I think now we we've learned enough that that they're they're kind of different incarnations of the same thing. So I think this stuff is all over the place. Which has been cool for me, at least, to to try and understand. Uh, okay, so I'll definitely stop there. Thanks for listening.